Hello and uh, welcome once again to the Nordic COP26 Pavilion in Glasgow where it is a very special day or a special time right now because um, part of our program here during COP26, a very important part of that, is that we are opening up uh, a Nordic hub in Helsinki and they are opening today on which with uh, this very first joint event where we have dialogue between participants both here and in Helsinki. So uh, we are introducing today an event on, on wetlands, resilience and management of Arctic wetlands. Um, and we will move to Tobias Salatha in a minute, but I would, uh, who is the moderator, but I would just like to say um, first uh, hello and welcome to Helsinki. Over to you, Mia. Hello, Michael. Hello, Glasgow. We are very happy to finally be able to open up the Nordic hub here in Helsinki, where we are looking much forward to having contact with you in several, several events during the coming week. And with me here, I have uh, Terhi, Terhi Lehtonen. I'm very happy to have you here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, we will also have uh, Mary McAllen, uh, the Scottish Minister for Environment and Land Reform. Uh, but I'm not sure that she, she is here now. She's arriving as we speak. Okay, Mary, come to the stage and we will have you mic'd up. Um, and then I will give the word over to Tobias. Uh, thank you much, very much and we look forward to this discussion. Thank you stay here. I'll give very it. much. Welcome to everybody. Uh, maybe I briefly introduce myself. I have the honor to moderate this session here. I'm working for the Convention on Wetlands. And uh, as you see behind me, that project on resilience and management of Arctic wetlands, of which we will hear uh, soon more, was very interesting also for the Convention on Wetlands as it was for the Arctic Council who obviously organized it. Uh, that's why I am pleased to be here and to manage between the State Secretary in Helsinki and the Scottish Minister, Mary McAllen, who is just joining us. She will be the first speaker and then we move over to Helsinki and then we have Gustav Hugelius, uh, the third speaker here. So I think then everything, the timing is perfect. May I invite you to present you why it is so important to bring together Scottish uh, wetlands, peatlands with Arctic peatlands. Everybody who was a little bit outside sees how they are very similar. And from the Convention on Wetlands, we do have to recognize the biggest part of the Arctic, and let's include Scotland for it, for that purpose as well, is actually covered by wetlands. All those tundra wet areas, the blanket bogs, the coastal zones, the peatlands in a wider sense, but also the, the coastal area, salt marshes, seagrass beds, if there are. So please, Minister McAllen. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me OK? Thank you for that kind introduction. And I very much liked you, including Scotland in the Arctic region. We like that. So thank you. Um, I'm so pleased to join you all today in the Nordic Pavilion um, to take this opportunity to highlight the strong links between Scotland and the Arctic region as well as the centrality of all of our wetlands to the challenges that we face. So we are one of the Arctic's closest geographical neighbours, but our connections go beyond just geography. We share so much uh, from our ambitions on empowering rural communities to accelerating decarbonisation, tackling climate change, um, supporting nature restoration, and promoting indigenous cultures. Now, the restoration and protection of wetland habitats is recognised in both Scotland and the Arctic region as a vital nature-based solution to those twin crises of climate change and biodiversity loss. We are taking action to conserve, to restore, to um, protect Scottish peatlands and I'm really pleased to have this opportunity today to share with you some of our challenges and opportunities. So peatland habitats are a key part of the Scottish landscape, as well as our cultural and natural heritage. 
approximately a quarter of Scotland's land is covered in peat, um, which stores around 3 billion tonnes of carbon. Peatland habitats also benefit our environment and our communities by supporting biodiversity, by improving water quality and by reducing flood risk. And of course, the condition of wetlands in Scotland and in our neighbouring Arctic nations are critically important in supporting millions of migratory waders and wildfowl, which use Scot Scotland uh, and Arctic wetlands for wintering and breeding respectively. However, historically, the ecosystems provided by peatlands have been undervalued. Public funding in the past has been encouraged towards practices which have undermined our peatlands, including drainage, extraction, development, overgrazing, and so on. And it's estimated that currently around 80% of Scotland's peatlands are in a degraded state. This is a, an enormous source of carbon emissions and therefore we urgently need to address it. So this is a challenge, but it also presents us with opportunities to mitigate climate change and also to work on restoring nature, which of course we know is intrinsically linked to the challenge of climate change. And on that note, Scotland, sadly, is seeing a dramatic decline in our biodiversity. We're working hard to reverse it, um, and protection and sustainable management of peatlands is a key part of that. I also think it's important to acknowledge that Scotland, like other countries, is a rich industrial nation. And we have disproportionately uh, contributed to the state of affairs that we now find ourselves in and we have a moral obligation to take action to address that. So we are committed to ramping up our actions in that regard. So I'd just like to go through some of what we have done to date, if you don't mind. Um, in order to create the conditions for healthy, resilient peatlands, we must do three things. Firstly, we must protect them from negative impacts. Secondly, we must then sustainably manage them for the future. And finally, we must restore and reverse as much of that damage as we possibly can. So on protection, peat in Scotland is largely extracted for use in horticulture. Um, and to a much smaller extent, it's extracted for use in our whiskey industry. And in our, speaking of cultural traditions, in our crofting communities, it has traditionally been cut and used as a source of fuel, although that has declined in recent years. As well as the physical loss of peat in our uh, ground, commercial extraction leads to drying, to loss of biodiversity, decomposition and uh, emissions of carbon thereafter. So we're taking action and we have pledged to phase out the use of peat in horticultural practice. And as a first step, we are now working on a ban on the sale of gardening products that use peat. And secondly, on the importance of sustainable management. In respo response to independent reviews, we are taking action to improve deer management. Because those of us who work in this area know just how much damage overpopulations of deer can cause to our wetlands. And finally, on restoration. We have been supporting restoration for a number of years now in Scotland. Um, since 2012, around 30,000 hectares of degraded peatlands have been put on the road to recovery through actions supported by Peatland Action, which the Scottish Government sponsor. This is really good progress, but much like everything in this great challenge of our time that we are facing, there is always much more to do. So we are committed to significantly increasing the rate and scale of restoration in Scotland. And in that regard, we have pledged £250 million over the next 10 years to uh, support restoration over a decade. This is a long term commitment and the multi-annual nature of the funding, we hope, will give the market the confidence that it needs to come in and support the public sector in this endeavour because Governments can and will lead the way, that's what we're trying to do, but we can't do this alone and we very much need uh, the support of private investors in this challenge. So as part of that, 
we're working hard to raise the profile of peatlands. And it's so good to be discussing it at COP26, to have a peatland pavilion, and to have the President of the United States mention peatlands in an address. This, I think, for those of you who've been working on this for a long time, would acknowledge that has not always been the case. Um, but we are having a transformation. I'd just like to point out, though, that in that transformation, it's not always going to be easy and there are some challenges. First of all, while our understanding of peatland science is developing, there are still gaps in the evidence base. In Scotland, we're working on research to map the location of peatland and to demonstrate to us what areas will um, derive the greatest benefit and we should focus on uh, from the offset with the greatest emissions reduction potential. Um, science and research will also help us to evaluate restoration techniques and help us to understand much more about the biodiversity impacts, challenges and opportunities there as well. One other thing we must try, always try to do, is understand people's behaviours and motivations, landowners' motivations for changing the way that they use our land towards our net zero targets. And of course, finance plays a significant part. We're taking major steps to invest in our natural capital. That quarter of a billion pounds that I mentioned is a big part of that, but we know it's not going to be enough on its own. As well as securing those resources, fundamental to peatland restoration and sustainable management is the understanding, the buy-in, the support of the landowners, the crofters, the farmers whose land has this degraded peat on it and will need to be restored. We believe that landowners in Scotland and throughout other nations have a really critical role to play in our journey to net zero and we want to empower them to do that. So going forward, we know that land use and land use change will be some of the most important, vexed, trying questions that we will have to grapple with in the coming 10 to 15 years. But the opportunities of doing so are clear to see. Peatland restoration and conservation present us with a compelling opportunity to stop the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases from them when they're degraded, to store greenhouse gases when they are restored, to support rare and beautiful ecosystems and support biodiversity, and to provide the opportunity for good green jobs in our rural communities who are so often without those kinds of opportunities. So that is enough from me. This opportunity today is about learning from friends in other countries about what you're doing and the, the shared opportunity that we have. So I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to you and I look forward to, to hearing your contributions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's uh, on a challenge. Thank you. Uh, I think that was a very rich, condensed uh, information on what Scotland is doing, was doing and continues to do. I can just add uh, the Convention on Wetland has just published last week detailed guidance on how to restore peatlands for the practitioners but also for the politicians, for the policy makers. A policy brief that uh, you can find that on ramsa.org uh, and that was largely inspired also by the work in Scotland. Uh, Ramsar.org, you, you may remember that the Convention on Wetlands celebrates this year its 50 years jubilee because it was signed in a town called Ramsar at the Caspian Sea. But now we have another innovation here and I'm turning around on the screen here and I uh, would like to invite the counterpart, uh, State Secretary and uh, uh, Derry Lechtonen. My Finnish pronunciation is probably very bad. But uh, please <laughs> tell us how the whole story looks from the Finnish side. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Macallan. That was a, a very interesting um, presentation and an intervention. I, I, would, I, I couldn't agree more <laughs> with what you said. And, and let me just start by congratulating the organizers for being, bringing this topic to the COP um, area. The, and, and as Mary already said, wetland restoration and conservation is a great example on how we can and must look at tackling climate and biodiversity crisis together. 
Now, some words about wetlands and peatlands in Finland. Myers and peatlands cover almost one third of Finnish land area, and they hold around 70% of our carbon stock. In fact, Finland, in Finnish Suomi, means a, a land of Myers, since Meyer in Finnish is Suo. More than half of Finland's original 10 0.4 million hectares of my area has been drained to meet the needs of forestry, agriculture, and pea production. Only 4.1 million hectares are still undrained. So, in fact, Finland has a world record in draining myers uh, when it comes to the proportion. The drainage has been strongest in southern Finland, where 75 to 90 percent of the myers are drained. About half of all Meyer habitats and 120 Meyer species in Finland are threatened. We use um, the use of energy uh, peat is quickly decreasing and therefore also pre peat extraction. From biodiversity perspective, some new threats appear like mining and peeling off sphagnum moss for, from the surface uh, of the Meyer. Climate change is also uh, lowering the water table of Myers and making them gradually drier. We may have the, the questionable world record in draining our Myers, but I'm also, I, or let me say that I'm more proud to say that Finland is also a pioneer country in ecological restoration. Myers are being restored to their natural state by blocking and damming ditches redirecting the waters back to the mire and removing excess trees. Mire restoration in Finland is primarily aimed at improving the hydro hydrology and condition of mire habitats and improving the conditions of mire species. Restoration leads to rapid recovery of the essential ecological functions of mires normally less in less than a decade. The, the recovery of species uh, appears promising, but is lower than the recovery of the natural function. So primarily, my restoration is ensuring an increasing biodiversity. Peatland restoration is also an opportunity to protect water bodies and bind atmospheric carbon and store it in the soil. As you know, uh, a drained mire, when lowering the groundwater levels, exposes peat to oxygen. Peat above the Water surface gradually decomposes and carbon dioxide releases into the atmosphere. In terms of long-term climate protection, maintaining a large carbon stock of peat is, is maintaining a large carbon stock of peat is essential. So conserving and restoring myers is the best way to preserve this carbon stock. Restoration protects the carbon stock in myers and starts accumulating more carbon in the peat layer. The climate benefits and disadvantages depend on the type of mire to be restored and the wetness of the restored myers. And, and Mary already raised that we, there is a lot of um, science still needed to be done and, and we need more information, but we know already quite a bit. The restoration of eutrophic forest drained myers seems to bring climate benefits in approximately 20 years. Um, in this case, emissions will begin to be, begin to decrease and the mire will gradually turn into a carbon sink. Restoring the most oligotrophic myers doesn't seem to produce climate benefits even in the longer term. On the other hand, the restoration of heavy, heavily modified myers, such as farmed peatland and peat extraction areas, will bring large climate benefits and faster. This is important for us in Finland also in view of our 2035 climate neutrality target to look into because these emissions are actually uh, the emissions from a heavily modified um, peatland, um, like the far farming area in peatland or, or peat extraction areas are quite large in, in our inventory. Now, when it comes to um, nature protection uh, and restoration. We have two funding programs. We have METSO for forest protection, and we have our new Helmi Habitats program to protect, manage, and restore our degraded habitats. The, ha the Helmi program uh, aims to stop the biodiversity loss, to strengthen Finland's biodiversity, and safeguard the vital ecosystem services. 
Habitat restoration improves the living conditions of rare and threatened species. The program is also working to curb climate change and to promote adaptation to it. Today, altogether, uh, 1.3 million hectares of Myers, which is 15% of the current peatland area, are protected. The majority of protected Myers are open oligotrophic fens in northern Finland. They are particularly imp important for wetland birds. The conservation status of the southern eutrophic and wooded Myers is unfortunately poor. The Helmi program target is to protect 60,000 more hectares of Myers by 2030, focusing mainly on nationally most valuable sites in, in terms of their biodiversity values and complementarity to the current network of protected Myers. We have actually already in 2015 done a very comprehensive uh, survey of the, of the most valuable Myers, and, and this is where we focus also with the, with the new Helmi program. The Helmi Meyer protection has had a powerful start. The milestone of 10,000 hectares protected will probably be exceeded by the end of 2021. Originally, around 50,000 hectares of the protected Myers have been drained before the protection process. So there is drained Myers even in protected areas. Um, and in fact, these we have been restoring such Myers already gradually. Uh, for a longer time, and, and I must admit that, that, that or uh, recognize that this has also been helped by, by EU funding from 1995. There has been uh, many EU life funding uh, projects that have been contributing to restoring those, uh, those mires. Um, today, about 34,000 hectares of drained sites in the protected areas have already been restored. And now the Helmi program aims to restore at least 60,000 hectares uh, of these, these mires that are still mires, but have, have had ditches. Uh, and these will be both in the protected areas and outside protected areas. An annual record of mire restoration was achieved in 2020 when 3,300 hectares of peatlands were restored. Now, colleagues, to conclude, Arctic wetlands have a global importance through their role in storing carbon, as well as bird habitats and migration pathways. Almost half of the world's wetlands are in the Arctic. We need to strengthen natural ecosystem capacity through conservation and restoration in the Arctic and boreal wetlands. Increased protection and restoration of degraded wetlands would yield substantial benefits to ecosystem services, biodiversity, and climate change mitigation. We are expecting this year that this year will be another record year in mire protection and restoration in Finland, with a widening group of operators like municipalities, companies, NGOs, um, the Forest Center in Finland, and the State Forestry Limited joining in. When there is a will, uh, there, there is also a way. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. State Secretary Lehtonen. I cannot add much more to those messages, but I want to like uh, invite Gustav Hugelius to tell us more about that Arctic Council project on resilience and management of Arctic wetlands in the broader Arctic sense. And uh, just one point maybe when uh, Minister McCullen said, uh, mentioned the land use change also. When I drove over in my train from Edinburgh this morning, I thought this is a little little bit like Suo country, but I was going through agricultural land where most of the Myers were drained, except the valley bottoms, but again, a lot of potential. But now, please, Gustav Hugelius. Thank you, Tobias, and uh, yeah, thank you all for coming, and I'm really happy to have the opportunity to present this, this work uh, that we have done in, um, within the Arctic Council. So I'm here representing uh, uh, the CAF working group of the Arctic Council, Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna. Uh, so this is a working group working within the Arctic Council on, the, on the, the preservation of Arctic biodiversity, but also, of course, with an eye to, to, to climate change mitigation and adaptation. So I'm presenting uh, the final conclusions of a, of a multi-year project called Resilience and Management of Arctic Wetlands that was presented uh, and accepted to, at, at, the, uh, at the Ministerial of the Arctic Council in May of 2021. 
So uh, we've already heard a lot of good examples from the, the previous speakers on the, the multiple benefits that wetlands provide to humanity. Climate mitigation, they've been, you know, northern peatlands have been sequestering carbon from the atmosphere literally for 10,000 10, years or more. They hold more than half of the global, carb, uh, global peat carbon stock are held in, in, in Arctic and subarctic peatlands. Uh, crucial biodiversity habitat uh, for you know, migratory birds. There are over, over 20,000 over 20, species within the Arctic region and a lot of these species are really you know, tied to the wetland habitats. Wetlands are also crucial for, for water, access to clean water, water purification of dampening of the hydrological cycle. You, you dampen floods, you also dampen droughts. So you, both the highs and the lows are dampened by, by, by the wetlands. And of course, food security, especially for indigenous peoples when you, uh, within the Arctic region, this is also an enormously important part of it. So Arctic wetlands are really globally important and have enormous potential to contribute to climate adaptation, mitigation, and the conservation of, of biodiversity. So the, the, the mandate or the task of the, the raw project, Resilience and Management of Arctic Wetlands, is, was producing policy recommendations to support measures and further develop management strategies to conserve wetland biodiversity and ecosystem services. So this, well, sorry, this has been a three-phase project running from 2017, uh, ending in 2021. It was initiated and chaired by Sweden and also co-chaired with Iceland. But I really want to emphasize that there's been support by all of the Arctic Council states and very, very good engagement with the permanent participants in the Arctic Council representing the different indigenous, indigenous peoples around the Circle Arctic region. Uh, there's been many phases and there's also been a lot of different uh, reports produced. The project had in the early phases, there was really a focus on gathering the extensive knowledge that exists. So, you know, both from, from indigenous peoples, from, from different you know, natural authorities, from researchers. There's a wide body of knowledge on this. So the, the, the initial phases have produced a lot of reports that condense knowledge, but that also give um, case study examples, success stories, perhaps also examples of things that work less well. You know, what aspects of, of, of wetland restoration from temporal, temperate and boreal systems can be applied in the Arctic and vice versa. Uh, a lot of inf good information. Uh, can be found here. You see the web page up there, caf.is slash wetland, and you find you know, the findings, the recommendations, and all of these reports there if you want to learn more, more about the findings of the project. Uh, so the final report uh, provides 13 key findings and 20 policy recommendations that were presented to the minister. And these are really designed to maintain and strengthen the resilience of wetlands. Uh, and we also want to emphasize that a lot of these findings and recommendations are highly relevant also outside of the Arctic. Um, partly in you know, the Arctic states, a lot of our Arctic states actually, we have territory in the Arctic, but we also have a lot of territory outside of the Arctic. So we hope that these policy recommendations can also be useful going into the boreal and temporal regions, but perhaps also for, you know, there, there might also be, be useful material here for, for other states uh, to look at. Uh, and yeah, we also want to emphasize that, I mean, you already heard from the previous speakers that um, you know, both Scotland and Finland are examples of countries that have a really large proportional coverage of wetlands. You also have really large proportional you know, co coverage of drained wetlands, uh, and the same is true for Sweden and a lot of other Arctic, or Arctic nations. Um, so we have, a, you know, we have a history in this, and we have a responsibility to, to sort of manage these wetlands uh, responsibly and, and, and effectively looking forward. Uh, but we also have the, you know, the capacity, hopefully, and the, you know, the, the opportunity now to really lead by example and, and you know, set good examples for other countries on, on, on co-design and you know, effective design of, of, of restoration management and protection of wetlands that really benefits all of these different ecosystem services. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of the findings and poli policy recommendations. Um, with the policy recommendations are sort of ordered by different themes, so I'm just going to go through the themes and give you an overview, and then if you're interested in more details, I would direct you to the, to the report. Uh, the f oh, my, my, my slide disappeared. Uh, well, the first theme, uh, the first overall theme is, is really a, a sort of a, a, a focusing on the, on the science results of... I can try to... Ah, it's back again. 
like the, uh, an overall summary of climate, you know, the potential for climate change mitigation, wetland biodiversity and, and, and resilience, really summarizing scientific findings. The second family of policy recommendations talks about importance of streamlining national wetland governance. If you look within different nations, we found that in a lot of nations there are many different authorities that are working sometimes in parallel to you know, conserve or work with, with wetlands and there's a lot of opportunity for, for government bodies to actually synergize more. There, there might be one agency that's responsible for the water balance while another agency is responsible for, for the climate gas exchange. And those two are, in, you know, th those are linked in a way that you cannot decouple them and they shouldn't be decoupled. So there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, and then other findings on more, more sort of hands-on findings or policy recommendations for wetland protection, conservation and restoration actions. So this, is, you know, this includes both protecting the wetlands that are still pristine, but then also what can be done actionably to, 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 to restore the wetlands that have been damaged. At present, 13% of the wetlands in the Arctic regions are, are protect in some form of protected areas, so national parks or nature reserves, etc. And uh, this number could very well rise, considering that so much of the Arctic region is actually covered by wetlands. Another very important finding relates to uh, indigenous knowledge systems, indigenous peoples and you know, local peoples. And all of you know, respecting the presence of indigenous peoples in the Arctic region over you know, centuries and millennia and finding that indigenous peoples are parts of these ecosystems. Uh, we, we need to view it in that way. So the knowledge systems, meaningful engagement, communication and outreach of the management, emphasizing co-design, co-production you know, co of, of, of the measures and really collaboration when it comes to, because this is really a long-term thing, and I think both of the earlier speakers have emphasized the importance of landowners and or you know, indigenous peoples in having them, they, they need to be in, a, in an equal driver's seat here when we're moving forward. Uh, we also recognize an a need for actually improved systems for wetland classification, mapping and monitoring. So this also actually relates to what both of the ministers have said, is that you know, we, do, we do need better maps and better understanding of exactly where the wetlands are and where they are damaged so that we can have effective measures implemented. Uh, and the final um, policy recommendations are on uh, improved coordination of Arctic wetland action, research and monitoring. So we see if some low-hanging uh, fruit on how Arctic uh, states and, per and permanent participants could collaborate on relatively short term to, to improve both all of these aspects of, of, of knowledge around wetland systems. Okay, so with that I'd like to thank you all and conclude. Thank you very much, Gustav. We, we are now moving to a panel discussion between uh, State Secretary in uh, Helsinki, the minister here, and uh, Gustav and Andrew Cooper from Scott Nature will come in also. And uh, we're taking also questions from the audience here in Glasgow. But as Mrs. McCallan has to move, uh, I would like her to maybe start. So after having heard all that substance, this substantial information, on what, on one hand, Scotland is doing, what Finland is doing, what other Arctic countries are doing, uh, how best then to, where is the biggest interest to work together? And maybe I can launch another interesting question. How about afforestation on peatlands? Uh, please, Mrs. McCallum. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Oh. We have to make sure that we hear everybody in Glasgow and Helsinki. Um, no, thank you very much for the interesting question. So, I think we need to collaborate for two reasons. Um, firstly, because of our geographical proximity. Um, that's a reason in and of itself, but also because we are presented with this shared ambition to restore our peatlands and the shared challenges, most of which you've, we've all gone through um, today. And I think that that's made even more so because the scale of the challenge that we all face with the, the climate and nature emergencies, the pace with which we need to now move in order to reduce our footprint within 2045 as our target, countries will have differing targets, means that we don't have time, frankly, to try and do this ourselves. Nobody has a monopoly on wisdom and we don't have time to just be siloed and to, be, um, to, have, to, to not be collaborating across borders. 
And the second reason that we need to collaborate is simply, and I'm sure that the other ministers that are involved here will agree that whilst peatlands and their restoration is a really complex scientific phenomenon, actually for decision makers, it's a, it's a no-brainer, to put it crudely, because there are so many co-benefits involved, um, be it you know, stopping the, the emissions, managing to absorb emissions, supporting biodiversity, supporting the water table. Um, for us, as not scientists, it's a no-brainer. So for those two reasons, I think we need to, collaboration's really important. Thank you. Uh, I, I asked the question about trees planting on peatlands. Yes, so trees, trees and peatlands, and actually there are other competing land uses as well, so food production. Um, and as the, in my ministerial portfolio, I have responsibility for forestry and for peatland restoration. So I think we just need to not see our land uses as being in conflict with one another and instead think about our land mass and think about the ways to optimize the land that we have in order to get us to where we need to be, which my vision is for more people in Scotland living and working sustainably on our land and that our land will help us to reach net zero. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe Mrs. Leighton in Helsinki wants to react. Thank you. Um, and and um, we are equally very interested in, in cooperation with the, with the Arctic countries and, and with Scotland on, on the wetland restoration issues, uh, the ecology and challenges with wetlands are, are similar in our countries. And and like uh, Mary said, we don't have no time to waste, so we, we better use the experience that we have uh, and, and and make use of the, the best practices. Now, I wanted to come back also on the question of um, afforestation on, on wetlands or peatlands or mires and I guess this is what has happened in Finland this was after the war and and there was a lot of drainage of mires in order to um, have forest and and at that time we didn't know um, the the climate um, damage in, in a way that the emissions that would result it wasn't something that we we looked into or understood at the time at the same time also maybe biodiversity we we did not uh, yet value or understand the risk to biodiversity that we're doing. So currently, uh, 18, I think around 20%, maybe 18% of our um, managed forest land is on peatland. But I think at, at the moment, it's, uh, I would be very surprised if, if there would be um, mires that would be converted to, to forest. Uh, this, I think, from, from climate perspective, doesn't make sense. On the other hand, there is a question, how do we need to manage these different types of wet uh, peatlands uh, that have forests, and I, th I think I'm, I'm not a scientist on this, but my understanding is that from the climate perspective, it's um, uh, not necessarily best to uh, rewet them um, if, if you know biodiversity hot spots uh, aside, but um, but rather that we have to take care in managing those forests that we don't do clear cuts where we we, we where the emissions are again. Uh, higher, but uh, so there. In in my view, there is very little interest in in afforesting on peatlands. Now, agricultural land that has been peatland. Again, I think it's um, area specific. But we when we create incentives for afforestation, we have to make sure that we do not, uh, you know, that we look into the climate balance as well. So this is uh, what we are doing. Thank you very much uh, from Helsinki. Maybe you've seen on the screen Andrew Cooper from Nature Scott. I would like to invite him for a reaction before coming back to Gustav Gelius. Please, Andrew, do you hear us? How do you react on what you just hear, heard? Thanks. I uh, hope you can hear me clearly enough. The uh, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, and, and it's everything. Everything it's, it's, has has been said is a you know thing with, with which I would agree. Um, should maybe make clear that we have very little natural uh, forestry on for, uh, well woodland on on bogs uh, in Scotland. We do have some, but they're they're, they're very rare. So most of the trees that we have on our our peatlands uh, have been planted there. Um, 
Now, where we have these plantations, well, I should first explain that we have a sort of controls in place to reduce a, the amount of new woodland that goes on to peatland. Basically, Scottish forestry won't give approval for any planting on peat that's more than 50 centimetres deep and won't give approval or, or grant support uh, for any ploughing of peatland soil that's more than 10 centimetres deep uh, for, for woodland establishment. So there's certainly been big changes there over the years in terms of uh, the relationship between trees and, and peat. When existing trees or an existing plantation uh, comes to maturity and is ready for harvesting, consideration will then be given to whether or not to, to restock, to replant that area or whether to restore it uh, back to, to a peatland habitat. And there's guidance available on that and that guidance sort of considers things like, well, how well have the, the trees performed? Have they grown well? Have they grown poorly? What's the next rotation likely to do? Uh, and also, what's the, what's the uh, adjacent land? I mean, if it's, if it's good quality peatland uh, adjacent to that plantation, then maybe restoring, maybe, it's, maybe that is damaging that peatland, having the trees there, and so it might, might sort of make it more likely that the, the area would be restored rather than a second rotation of, of planting going in. So yes, there are, there are legacy issues like that to deal with, um, but there's, and there's quite a lot of peat, uh, restoration from trees back to bog going on in Scotland now. Thank you. Let's not forget that in the climate context, obviously, the big advantage of peat soils is that they can store the carbon extracted from the atmosphere for millennia, while the trees is obviously a relatively short cycle until they are harvested again. Uh, maybe, Gustav, you would like to react a little bit on that debate also from the Arctic context. Uh, land use change is maybe not that much an issue further north than, than right here, but maybe it will become. Uh, it was mentioned also that uh, peat is still harvested mainly for horticultural substrate. Uh, then somebody mentioned sargnums farming, uh, so the peat moss farming for, for farming them that the industry has enough substrate. Is that an issue in the Arctic also? It, um the Arctic is a, it's, it's a big region and it's a very diverse region. So I find that so we have some parts of the Arctic where at least historically there has been a lot of drainage and uh, peat mining, uh, especially in, in, in the Scandinavian countries. We heard from Finland, also Sweden, a lot of forestry within the Arctic, within the CAF boundaries, so say within the Arctic region as defined by the Arctic Council, there are different definitions. But in other parts of the Arctic, like when you go, if you go to East Siberia, large parts of Canada or Alaska, the wetlands remain basically pristine. Uh, I mean, they have been, you know, managed by, by indigenous peoples for, for, for a long time, but they have not been, you know, actively degraded for, 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 you know, very, very active land use changes. What we do see there instead is, you know, an immense threat from climate change, where we actually see that permafrost, permafrost peatlands, if, as they thaw under climate warming, they have a very substantial switch from being a sink that cools the climate to actually warming the climate. And we see that the projected shift of, 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 uh, of that you know, greenhouse gas capacity of, of, of northern peatlands will actually shift the whole northern peatland the carbon sink into being a source for several hundred years. Um, so we also have, you know, there, there's land use and then there's the climate threat and then we need to manage both of those uh, in ways that are that are resilient, which is challenging, for sure. Thank you. Is there any question from the audience? Yes, please. I here from Glasgow. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is: Have you considered uh, working also with countries in South America, such as Chile and Argentina, that also have lots of wetlands, peatlands, tundra? And we're in countries such as these with well, the less resources, it's, it might be harder to actually preserve them and restore them. And they are actually getting harvested for, to use as uh, fertilizer and uh, substrate for agriculture. So it's, it's also a huge problem there. Have you ever considered working with them? It might not be the same ecosystem that it is in the Nordic, in the Nordic countries, but it's still really similar. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Maybe I should remind that uh, there is, since a few years, the Global Peatlands Initiative, which is led by UNEP, 
of which a, a, a number of conventions, including Ramsar Convention, Biodiversity Conventions, are partners, but also countries and, uh, and other, many other partners, including those represented here. And uh, there, the, the southern boreal peatlands, Tierra del Fuego and so, are very much uh, in focus as well. They are quite similar, in, in fact, uh, in ecosystems. Just to remind, respond to that question, there was another one here, please. Thank you. Um, I'm from uh, Ireland and we've got a lot of peatland as well. And actually, to our Finnish uh, colleagues who, who are on the, um, in the, on the panel, uh, we were very much influenced by Finland in developing our peat extraction industry many years ago. So things have come full circle. But my question is, um, as to drain peatlands, uh, what is the panel's view on how farmers should be compensated? Um, and what would you view the balance that should exist between voluntary uh, restoration by farmers and um, more compulsory measures? Thank you. Do we have a comment from uh, Helsinki or a requ response to that? Yes, sure, sure. Let, let me try. Um, um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure if um, you, you spoke about farmers and, and here if I'm thinking about agriculture, we have also a lot of agricultural land that is peatland and actually, unfortunately, I have to uh, admit that there is still some clearing or, or some draining of, of um, mires for also agricultural land that we would ideally want to want to stop. Um, and there's some, some issues also with the agricultural um, farm subsidies that um, are, are not helping this and and this is where we have uh, decided um, with this government to start trying that we, we put some of our national agricultural um, subsidies to try to have um, paludi culture uh, on those um, on I think it was 50,000 hectares of, of uh, peatland uh, farmland to try to see if we could reduce the emissions by having a higher water table in, in those fields and and, and supporting obviously those farmers um, in, in those activities. Now, when it comes to the owners of the um, peat extraction um, land, uh, we have also, again here, in fact, that extraction has reduced significantly, mainly because of the carbon price under emissions trading scheme, and that has driven the, the, the energy use of peat down. It's been a, a pricing, uh, impact, but also the policies and, and the targets that cities and, and, and local authorities and the government has set for uh, climate neutrality and, and the, the how, how would, would I say that the, the use of energy use of peat has come down really fast. So that has actually been uh, an issue of transition in, in the peat uh, extraction sector. There is um, um, companies, um, owners of those lands, and we have with this government, we have introduced a, a whole program for a just and fair transition for, for that uh, sector. I'm not sure if, if that answered entirely, but... Uh... Thank you very much for this very pertinent uh, response from Helsinki. I'm afraid we are getting to the end of that time, but uh, this is really the important point where we can uh, round up this afternoon. Uh, those 15% of the global peatlands which have been drained, they emit about four to five of the human-made emissions. So that's where there's the biggest potential to cut down with the emissions by re-wetting them. And uh, Mrs. Leitonen mentioned the word paludiculture, produce something under wet conditions, uh, which uh, brings another income, but still brings income. That is probably the theme for the next uh, next COP or so, or hopefully before then. Thank you, everybody who was uh, participating. I think the technology was working very fell. well. Thank you to Helsinki, to Andrew also online, Gustav and the Minister McCallan who has left us. And I give him back to the Nordic Pavilion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobias. And uh, this was our, our first uh, truly joint event uh, between uh, 
Helsinki and uh, Glasgow with our Nordic Hub opening today and uh, they will have an exciting program for the next week that you can also follow uh, online both at we don't have time uh, dot, dot, uh, org and um, at uh, norden.org so uh, we look forward to this Mia and uh, great to see you over there and uh, we will uh, look forward to this coming week uh, where the COP really goes into the final phases. Thank you very much, Michael.